So now we're going to look at DC blocking circuits. So you recall when we did the first part of the lab, we looked at the step response of the RL circuit. We have our RL circuit right there, and when we put a step voltage on the input, or we have our time scale here and our volts over here, then the response of the inductor jumped up and then it decayed back down to zero. Right? And that's the circuit that blocks DC. In other words, the step function really looks like DC. It's like turning on a switch to a battery and it stays at a constant voltage forever. And you can see the RL circuit rejects that. It says, I don't want to pass the DC and it ends up going back to zero. But we know that it responds to the change, right? Because the step, when it steps, is a big change. And you can imagine, you know, if this waveform after a certain amount of time step back down, the response of the inductor will do something like this. You could draw that in two colors. I'm going to redraw the inductor in red. So inductor voltage is in red right here, and then the step voltage is in, is in black. So we could take advantage of that situation and say that, okay, if we want to block DC but pass other frequencies, we could do something like connect our amplifier. Remember we had our differential amplifier. I'm just going to draw it as an amplifier for now from uh, part two, level two of lab five, right, where we were working with our hair dryer circuit. So that's saying that if we do something like this, you know, we have our RL circuit right there, we could block the DC that's going to appear on the output of this amplifier. And then maybe we could put in another stage of gain. I'm just going to draw a universal gain stage, it has some value k, and we could amplify the signal minus the DC, because the DC is being blocked right here. We're only going to amplify the AC or the things that change. So it turns out, and we saw in the lab, that inductors are really kind of hard to work with. So in order to make a time constant that's as slow as we need for the circuit, we'd need to have a gigantic inductor. It's going to have a lot of losses. It's going to probably weigh 10 pounds. So instead of using the RL circuit, we could use a variant of the RC circuit. So you remember from the lab that the RC circuit, just switch in a capacitor right here, blocked the AC and it passed the DC. It's almost the complete opposite of what the, what the RL circuit did. And I could use my red marker once again and say that in response to a step function, the output of the voltage across the capacitor asymptoted to a final value. And then when we step back down, it did the same thing. So this circuit right here likes to pass DC and block AC. You can almost think of an RC circuit as an averaging device where it's averaging the input across the capacitor because the capacitor is storing energy. So what we could do to avoid using an inductor is we could switch around the order of the resistor and the capacitor. Put our capacitor now in series and the resistor in parallel. And then if we measure the voltage across the resistor, it's going to look like the RL circuit response. So in other words, it's going to, when we have the change, when our step goes positive, the resistor voltage is going to jump up, then it's going to exponentially decay back down to zero. It would do the same thing here for this negative transition of the step. So now taking that knowledge, if you go over here, and change up our circuit a bit. We could stick a capacitor in here, and then a resistor going to ground, and that could go to our next stage of gain. And that's what we're going to do with this circuit. So the big question, though, is going to be, what should our RC time constant be? Right, that's kind of a, a question, and that really depends on what our drift looks like. So we could look back to the oscilloscope over here. I have the scope on a really slow time scale. It's on 50 seconds per division. So the whole entire time I've talking, I was talking, this was drifting slowly, slowly down. And it drifted, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So over 350 seconds, it drifted about 0.3 volts. We're on one volt per division over here. So that's a super slow time constant. And we could say if we made a, uh, you know, a graph of something like that, you know, if we say that our initial condition was at 0.3 volts and we exponentially decayed back down to zero 
rate over 350 seconds, you know, what would the time constant of that be? So that's something we could figure out. We could approximate it. We're not going to get the actual thing, but we could figure out like a rough order of magnitude. And we could do that by saying that 0.3 volts is our initial condition. And then what's the time constant, right? Well, we know that you know, we should be at 0.37 or point, yeah, 0.37 of our initial value. So if we take 0.3, say 0 0.3 volts times 0 0.37, let's see, it's going to be you know, somewhere around like 0 0.09 volts, right? So 3 times 3. So we could say that when we get to 0 0.09 volts-ish, we're going to have gone through one time constant. So what I could do is I could push save on the scope and we can analyze that data. So I'm going to save it as a PNG file and then I'm also going to save it as a CSV file. The CSV file will allow us to look at that and analyze it numerically.